In this video, I'm going to discuss the basics of industry analysis. So I'll talk about why we use industry analysis. I'll talk about how we identify which industry or industries a firm is in. And I'll talk about various components of industry analysis. I'll also give you a breakdown of why we always want to perform Porter's Five Forces when we're analyzing an industry. So let's get started. So why do we use industry analysis? Well, the short answer is macroeconomic performance. Well, the short answer is that industry performance is going to vary across a broad economy. So in an economy, you can have good industries and bad industries, outperforming industries, underperforming industries. And so it's important to understand where an industry is. So for example, back in the 1920s with the rise of the automobile, the market for buggy whips was obviously declining because, well, fewer people needed buggy whips. Uh, in 2021, 2020, 2019, and for a long time, the market for video stores has also not been great. So obviously we would not want to invest in a chain of video stores. I, I don't think there's more than one blockbuster left in the United States, but there it is. So what I'm trying to convey here is that just like we want to analyze macroeconomic conditions, we also want to analyze industry conditions. We want to make sure that once we've identified a good economy to be investing in, we can identify the best industries to overweight in our portfolio. And what we're going to find as we go forward in our, our discussion and as you collect data is that a lot of the industries will have various leading indicators that are industry specific. All right, so let's talk about how we define an industry. And there's several different ways to do this. The most common ways to identify an industry are classification codes. So we have the GICS codes, which are very prominent. Uh, Bloomberg will also have its own classification system. We can also use the very popular SIC codes, which are four digit codes. And then we can also use NIACS codes or NAICS codes. So these SIC codes and NAICS codes, these are very useful. They allow you to identify an industry based on, well, some number. And firms with the same industry code, the same SIC code, the same NAICS code will operate in the same industry. Now, there are some other ways besides just a firm getting assigned or selecting a NAICS code that we can identify which industry a firm is in. A very popular way to identify the industry that a firm is in is by calculating the correlation between the firm's returns and the returns of other firms. And if we identify that let's say Starbucks returns are highly correlated with McDonald's returns, and we know that McDonald's is in the restaurant industry, then we can reasonably conclude that Starbucks is very likely to be in the restaurant industry because its returns are very positively correlated with McDonald's. And that means that a lot of the drivers of its returns are similar to that of McDonald's. Now we do run into some issues with codes and the correlations here. And one of the biggest issues we face is that some firms are conglomerates. So for example, GE uh, historically has been the classic conglomerate. It has operations across a variety of industries, although GE, uh, as of the time I'm recording this video, is in the process of breaking up into more focused industries. So the firm is uh, divesting several assets across several sectors. All right, so let's take a look at an example of NAICS codes. So NAICS codes, like I said, this is a classification system and NAICS codes have six digits always. And let's say we have a company with a NAICS code of 236210. Well, we can classify this firm as being in the industrial building construction industry. However, if we wanted to identify other competitors whose operations are fairly similar, we might drop off the last or maybe the last two digits of this NAICS code and go up to the, let's say the 2362 NAICS code, the four digit NAICS code, which would be non-residential building construction. We could even go up further to, let's say the two digit NAICS code. So 23, and that'd be construction. So NAICS codes, they allow you to get very granular with your comparison or your, your construction of your industry. Now, once we've identified the industry or industries that a firm operates in, we need to identify the stage of the life cycle that that industry is in. And 
there's a couple of different classification systems out there. They all kind of look like this, where you have essentially a startup phase where most of the competitors are rapidly growing. There's a lot of turnover. There's a lot of uh, firms running in the red. Uh, but after that stage, where you start to see a lot of new patents being developed, uh, you do see this period of stable growth. And it's in this stable growth stage or the consolidation stage where you do see a lot of acquisitions taking place. You see uh, a lot of competitors either becoming profitable for the first time or maybe being run out of business if they're, uh, let's say their strategy is not ideal or they have some issues with their operations. Uh, next, we have the maturity stage. And in that stage, we see typically slowing growth. So slowing growth in terms of sales, slowing growth in terms of profit. Uh, a lot of the big blue chip companies that we often talk about are going to be in this maturity stage. So, you know, they're, they are very big, but they're slowly growing. Maybe they're growing at 3%, 4% per year. Uh, and, you know, they're, they might be making acquisitions uh, to try and increase that growth rate. Now, the final stage, the stage that we typically like to stay away from is the relative decline stage. And this is where we start to see either minimal or even negative growth. And it's in this stage where companies or competitors tend to see massive drop-offs in some cases of uh, their sales. Maybe some new technology comes around and it, it steals market share from our firm. So for example, let's say the internet has become very popular and we're looking at the brick and mortar retail industry. Uh, so, you know, companies like Macy's or Kohl's or, uh, you know, th those kind of firms. With the rise of the internet, a lot of customers are going to choose to shop online. And so Macy's, Kohl's, a lot of these competitors, if they can't drive customers to their online store and adapt, they're likely to enter bankruptcy. Now, I, I should point out that even if an industry is in relative decline, there may be one or two competitors in that industry that continue to be profitable. Uh, so, for example, in that brick-and-mortar retail industry, Kohl's for a long time has been a, a good performer uh, because they've, they've found a way to you know, uh, capture customers. They have a good online store presence. Uh, they typically don't locate in malls. They have off-site uh, brick-and-mortar stores. Uh, so they've, they've found a way to kind of break out of that brick-and-mortar retail mold in a, in a small way. Okay. So now we've identified the industry or industries that our firm operates in, and we know something about the conditions in that industry. What happens next? Well, the short answer is sector rotation. And sector rotation is this process where we adjust the weight of each industry and sector in our portfolio to avoid losses due to changes in the business cycle. So Obviously, before we've gotten to this point in the top-down approach, we've identified macroeconomic conditions in the markets in which our firms are going to operate. We know where we are in the business cycle. Well, sector rotation takes that information and takes information about the industries in which our firms operate. And what we do is we adjust the weights so that we can maximize our return based on how each industry is likely to perform in a different stage of the business cycle. So what we often do is we want to identify which firms are in cyclical industries and which firms are in defensive industries. Okay, so how do we identify cyclical versus defensive industries? Well, let's start with cyclical industries. The cyclical industries tend to, tend to outperform when market conditions are good. So these industries, they tend to have very, very uh, sensitive cash flows to the state of the economy. So airline manufacturers, uh, auto manufacturers, any company that provides any kind of capital goods, uh, any travel agency, any company related to travel, so cruise liners, uh, these companies, they tend to outperform and generate profits when, well, investors are, you know, they have a lot of disposable income when consumers are spending. Uh, we define cyclical industries very often by their high betas. So if the average beta in the industry is, let's say, 1.5 or even like 1.1, we would typically say that that's likely a cyclical industry. We can also look at the average market-to-book ratio of the industry, and if it's quite high, 
uh, we would typically say that these are these are what we would call growth stocks, and they're stocks of companies that are very likely in cyclical industries. So, for example, tech stocks. Tech stocks tend to have very high growth, uh, so market to book ratios, and they tend to be uh, classified as cyclical industries. Okay, on the other hand, defensive industries tend to be very insensitive to the business cycle. So uh, you'll see less volatility with these companies. Uh, these tend to be companies like food producers, food processors, uh, grocery stores, pharmaceutical firms, public utilities. All of these companies are gonna have very low betas. and. Uh, another key takeaway here is that these firms will have very, very low uh, product elasticity. These, the goods and services that these companies sell have very inelastic demand. Uh, people are always going to want those goods or services. So medicine, electricity, food, uh, household goods that you're always going to need. Now, I think it's important that I do give a little attention to the primary measures that we use to identify sensitivity to the business cycle. Uh, obviously, I've already talked about beta. The higher the beta, the more likely an industry is to be a uh, cyclical industry. Uh, the lower it is, so if it's below one, typically we'd say that's a defensive industry or a, the stocks in that industry are defensive stocks. Uh, next, we also want to look at whether or not the firm or firms in that industry produce necessities or discretionary goods. If firms in that industry produce a lot of discretionary goods, typically we would classify those firms as being in cyclical industries. The reason being, if there's a downturn, fewer people are going to buy discretionary goods and returns for those firms are going to underperform the returns for firms in more defensive industries. And then the third measure of sensitivity to the business cycle I did want to mention here is the operating leverage. And operating leverage is really just our profit before interest and taxes as a percentage of sales. And what we typically do here is we use this DOL equation, the degree of operating leverage equation. So we take the percentage change in EBIT divided by the percentage change in sales. And we can calculate this a couple of different ways. We could look at this year over year, or if we had some forecasts, we could include those. But the way to read this is a 1% change in sales will have a an X percent change in EBIT. So if our degree of operating leverage was 1.5, what this would say is a 1% change in sales would have a 1.5% change in EBIT, or earnings before interest and taxes. Okay, so now let's talk about where you can get some information on a firm's business segments. Uh, we'll start off with the, the breakdown of a firm's suppliers and buyers. So there is a function in Bloomberg, the SPLC function. Uh, this is our supply chain function. And if you're analyzing a U.S. publicly traded firm that's large enough, a lot of times you're going to be able to identify uh, several of the firm's largest suppliers and buyers. So, for example, if I'm looking at Starbucks, we can get a sense of this supply chain function in action. So the data that Bloomberg has for Starbucks indicates that we have 166 named suppliers and we have about 35 named customers. Uh, some of these customers like Carrefour, uh, Cisco, these are going to be big, big brands. So uh, Carrefour is a French grocery uh, store. And then if we look at their suppliers, notice here that we have a couple suppliers that are very likely providing, let's say, coffee cups, uh, the lids, uh, maybe the carafes that store the coffee, things like that. Uh, down here, we have a list of Starbucks main competitors. So things like, oh, the Cheesecake Factory or BJ's Restaurants or Chipotle. Now, the way that Bloomberg actually identifies competitors here is, I, I, I believe it's a combination of correlation of returns and then also uh, industry codes. There are better ways to do this. I, I tend to prefer the correlation method. So just looking at the firm with which your your firm has the highest correlation. So in the case of Starbucks, as, as of the time that I pulled this data, uh, Starbucks's closest competitor was McDonald's. 
In addition to using the SPLC function, we can also use the FA function to analyze the various industries and geographic locations where a firm operates. Uh, so the downside to this though is that if a firm doesn't have at least 10% of its operations in that industry or that geographic area, it's very likely not going to provide information on uh, its sales in that industry or that geographic area. So you'll see this in class. Now, one of the most important pieces of analysis that we want to perform anytime we're doing industry analysis is Porter's Five Forces. And the reason we care about Porter's Five Forces is because when we put this thing together, it's going to detail the industry structure, the risks to that industry and firms in that industry, and the possible performance of that industry going forward. And Porter's Five Forces are the threat of entry, the rivalry between existing competitors, pressure from substitute products, bargaining power of buyers, and bargaining power of suppliers. Now what we want to do is we want to read enough about our firm to get a sense of how each of these forces will affect our firm's industry. So obviously we want to hopefully be invested in firms in an industry where there's very little threat of entry. An example of this might be the airline industry, where the startup costs for a new airline competitor are very, very high. So that's very good from our perspective as investors in an existing company. Next, we also like to see, well, relatively low rivalry between existing competitors. The reason we like to see this is because if there's less rivalry, uh, profit margins are likely to be higher. We don't want firms cannibalizing each other's profit. We don't want essentially just a purely competitive market. Pressure from substitute products indicates that we don't want to have this threat of a new substitute coming in and stealing our customers. Uh, so an example of this might be if we're, uh, we've invested in an auto dealership and the city announces that it's going to build a, a subway system. Well, in that case, our potential customers are less likely to need cars to get around, uh, so this could be a threat to our business model. Uh, we also want to know the bargaining power of buyers and suppliers. Obviously, we don't want either of these groups having a lot of bargaining power. Uh, so we want to, I mean, if we're just trying to maximize shareholder value, we want to make sure that our buyers have very little bargaining power, so hopefully we're one of very few competitors in an area. And we also want to make sure that we have a very, very large amount of bargaining power against our suppliers. We want to be able to walk away or have that threat of walking away and if we don't get the price that we like from our suppliers. So let me just show you what this might look like for a company like Starbucks. So with Starbucks, I would rate the industry rivalry as quite high because there's a lot of different coffee shops. So uh, the market for specialty coffees and teas is extremely competitive, both in person and online. Uh, so anywhere you go, you're always going to find a local coffee shop. The bargaining power of suppliers is fairly low. The reason for this is because there's a large, large number of suppliers for all of Starbucks inputs. This means that Starbucks has a pretty good negotiating position with each of its suppliers. Customers, however, I would rate this bargaining power as moderate. And the reason I'd rate it as such is because in a lot of geographic areas, customers have a lot of coffee shops to choose from. And a lot of coffee shops have some kind of gimmick or maybe they, they're competing on cost. And so Starbucks, as a result, has had to find ways to capture customers or keep them from rivals. So offering food options or diversifying operations into specialty coffee and tea products. So anytime I go to the campus Starbucks, I always notice that I'm the only person getting coffee, like black coffee. Everyone else who is usually a freshman, sophomore, junior uh, is getting some kind of specialty drink. They actually look at me funny when I order just plain black coffee. Okay, next we have the threat of new market entrance. And this I'd rate as high. The reason being that the cost to open a specialty coffee shop is quite low. Uh, so this means that everybody with a little bit of money is likely to try and open up a new coffee shop. This is why Starbucks, I believe, has chosen to not compete on cost. I mean, 
that's very likely a losing strategy because coffee is very, very cheap to produce and sell. Starbucks, their brand adds value to their coffee. I mean, there's a reason why you pay, I think I pay like $2 and change for a cup of black coffee. It's the experience. I, I have a nice place to sit while I drink my coffee. It's a good ambiance. I get to enjoy myself for a few minutes. And then finally, we have the threat of substitutes. Uh, for a company like Starbucks, I would rate this as moderate. And the reason I'd rate it as moderate as of the time I'm writing this is because, well, the pandemic has given consumers an opportunity to work from home and discover coffee brewing from home. Uh, so although Starbucks sells a large number of coffee beans, specialty drinks, uh, there is a very, very large market for coffee drinks or other caffeinated beverages online. And so this is actually a threat to Starbucks. Okay, so once we've identified our forces that affect the industry and we've identified the supply chain and threats to that supply chain and we've identified the sales that are coming from various industries or various countries, how do we use that information? Well, if we're building, let's say, a spreadsheet model, what we can do is we can take that industry information and along with the macroeconomic information that we've already collected, we can adjust our estimates of sales, of our profit margin, of our discount rate in our spreadsheet models. So what I'm trying to get at here is the information that you're collecting on your firm's industry or industries should give you a sense of how profitable it's going to be, how many units it can sell potentially in the future, and when it comes time to value that company, we want to take that industry information and use it to improve our model. Okay, so let's summarize what we talked about. So first off, we can use industry codes and return correlations to determine the industry or industries our firm operates in. Next, once we've identified the industry or industries that our firm operates in and we've identified where that industry life cycle is, we can use sector rotation and we can adjust the weights of various sectors in our portfolio to try and maximize the return based on the stage of the business cycle we believe that we're in. Next, it's always important to perform Porter's Five Forces, and the reason for this is that, quite frankly, this will give you a sense of the competitive environment of your industry or the industry that your firm is operating in. And then finally, once we have all of this information, we can include that industry and macroeconomic information in our valuation models to improve our model accuracy. Okay, so with that, I'm going to bring this video to an end. But if you do have questions, please feel free to reach out. Uh, if you don't, I will see you in class. Uh, thank you.